where I was on January 6th in the House chamber, uh, watching what I hoped would be a fairly boring ceremonial exercise in recognizing formally the results of an election that, uh, that we had in our country. And as I'm sure you know, there was a little bit of drama, more than a little bit of drama on that day. And we know that, um, that we are not yet past uh, the divisions and the anger uh, and the anxiety that defined American politics for the last four years. Um, much more to say about that. But um, I also want to tell you what it was like to be in that same place, to be at the Capitol on January 20th. Um, and whatever uh, party we belong to, whoever you voted for in the November election, um, I, I hope you would agree with me that it is inspiring every four years to see the American people gather at our capital to mark the transfer of power from one freely elected leader to another. Um, we had a lot of tension and drama over this process this year, but at the end of the day, we can look back and say that this amazing democratic system of government that we have in our country, that we have fought for so many times, worked, it did its job. People all across this country in responsible positions, Republicans and Democrats followed the rules, followed the law under tremendous pressure and did the right thing. And we did on January 20th, what we do every four years on January 20th, we came together to mark that passage, that transfer of power. And we did so, I think, in a spirit of great hope for the coming months and the coming years. Um, I think the big difference right now, setting aside ideology, setting aside differences on policy, is that we can find unity, the word that President Biden used so many times in his inaugural address, on the things that ought to bring us together, even if we disagree passionately about how to solve specific problems in our country. We can have unity around simple concepts like telling the truth and obeying the rule of law, um, unity around respecting the process and the system and the votes of the American people, even if we may not like the result, unity um, around the very old fashioned concept that if you violate those principles, there ought to be some stigma, there ought to be some shame, there ought to be some accountability. Um, that is, I think, part of the promise of, of this moment. Um, and I think also unity around the idea that your job in government, whether you're the president or the vice president or a cabinet secretary or a member of Congress, your job is to report to work every single morning um, and to try to put your constituents' interests ahead of your own, try to solve problems. And right now, we've got some problems. We've got an overriding urgent problem of dealing with and finally crushing this terrible pandemic, which has cost us more lives than the wars that our country um, has fought in the past, than World War II. Um, this is the, the, the challenge that this new administration has inherited. And, um, and I think uh, it has been shocking to them, maybe shouldn't have been a surprise, but shocking to them what a shambles they inherited in terms of um, complete absence of any national strategy to deal with this crisis. So we are now working together, House, Senate, um, and the administration to finally use the instruments of government in the interests of the American people to get this crisis behind us. And so that is our first order of business and my number one priority over the next two or three weeks to try to find agreement um, between the House and the Senate and the President on um, uh, additional legislation to deal with the coronavirus crisis. Um, we need obviously, and I know we'll talk a lot about this today, we've, we've got to ramp up vaccinations. Um, we're doing about 25,000 a day in New Jersey, which is a lot, but it is not enough. Um, we have to continue to ramp up testing. Let's not forget 
that that will remain an extraordinarily important part of this process, even as we uh, uh, get vaccinated. Um, and we have to do these things in a targeted way, keeping in mind not just the demands of public health, but other really important um, uh, social needs, like, for example, getting our schools open. Um, Joe Biden has said he, he, he wants a strategy that will enable most um, uh, most uh, schools in our country to reopen um, for in-person education uh, within 100 days. Um, and that's not going to be easy, but it's going to require prioritizing both testing and vaccination uh, for school employees. And it's going to require a whole lot more money to enable schools to do whatever it takes to make them safe for in-person instruction. Um, that's something I really want to see come out uh, of the next legislation that, um, that we agree to. Obviously, we need more economic relief um, because until we all get that uh, literal shot in the arm, um, the economy is not going to be yet ready for the shot in the arm that gets us back uh, to normal. Um, so we're going to need to, and we are extending um, uh, the, the student loan uh, deferrals, the, uh, the, the, the uh, moratorium on evictions, assistance for renters uh, and, and landlords, um, small business relief, of course, which we did in the bill that we passed uh, in December. Uh, there's uh, an ongoing debate, as I'm sure you know, about the stimulus checks. We approved $600 in December. Uh, President Biden has approved another 14, has proposed another $1,400 per person. That's something the Congress is going to have to consider in the coming weeks, days even, and I'd love to get your input um, uh, on that. Uh, he's also proposed uh, a very significant expansion uh, in the child tax credit, which I am very, very strongly supportive of, even more so, I think, than the stimulus checks. If we do this, we cut child poverty in America in half, in addition to putting money in the pockets of hardworking families who will spend it to stimulate uh, uh, our economy. Um, so that's, that's uh, the COVID response that I hope that we get to uh, and adopt uh, relatively shortly. Then we got to stimulate the economy. Um, once uh, folks feel like it's truly safe to go back to work uh, and school. And as many of you have heard me say before, my number one priority there is a massive investment in public infrastructure in our country. Um, we need it anyway. Obviously, in New Jersey, we've got tremendous work to be done to fix our roads and our railroads and our tunnels and our bridges and our airports and our seaports. Um, we've got huge projects like the Gateway Project, the Hudson River Tunnel. We made progress in my first term on the first part of that. We are now going uh, with President Biden's help to get the funding and approval we need for the Hudson River Tunnel. So that's great news, but the whole country needs massive, massive investment. Um, there's also a huge opportunity here because interest rates are basically at zero. This is the time to invest in the future. And if we do it in a smart way, not only do we fix a lot of stuff, not only do we make our commutes better, but we can also speed the absolutely necessary transition of our economy from, uh, from fossil fuels to clean energy. Um, to protect our, our health, our safety against uh, the devastating effects of climate change, and to make America the world leader in transitioning the entire world to uh, this new way of, of generating energy. So if we're going to be spending the money anyway on infrastructure, that's how I want to do it. And so that's going to be a huge priority for me. Um, we've made a lot of promises in the last two elections on health care as well. And we now have a majority in the House and the Senate and a president, uh, very narrow majorities, but a majority nonetheless, that agrees that uh, instead of repealing the Affordable Care Act, we need to take the next and necessary step to strengthen it. So I hope we have a chance to talk about that as well. I think that will be a major priority uh, for the coming year. Um, and then, um, look, overarching goal, those are policy issues. Um, we do need to deal with um, some of the things that have been holding us back in our politics. 
the disinformation, the hate, um, the division uh, that is out there, uh, some of which has been fomented deliberately by leaders in our society, um, but which is also spread by technology, by social media, um, by this engine that companies like Facebook and Twitter and, and Google have created to divide us, to, to feed everybody the most extreme versions of what we already believe, the most hateful versions of what we already hate, the most fearful versions of what we already fear. So that, um, you know, at the extreme, you've got a mob um, attacking the Capitol, beating police officers to death, yelling, hang Mike Pence. And they believe honestly, sincerely in their hearts that they're doing the right thing. They believe honestly, sincerely in their hearts that almost every American agrees with them. And how did they come to believe that? That's something we have to seriously examine as a country. And as many of you know, I've been speaking out about, about this since I got elected. And right now I'm leading an effort in the house to hold these social media companies accountable for basically the way they've designed their social networks to have this effect on us. And we have legislation I'll be reintroducing um, later, uh, well, fairly early this year, shortly, um, to, to address that problem as well. And I think whether you're conservative, liberal, right or left, it, it shouldn't matter. Uh, we all have uh, an interest in, in dealing with, with that disinformation and propaganda that pushes everybody on every side further to the extreme. So um, those are some of the things I'm working on uh, and thinking about, but I get my priorities from you guys. So I, I really look forward to hearing your questions and concerns and suggestions. And so I will turn it over to you and look forward to taking any questions you might have. Thanks again. Thank you, Tom, for those opening remarks. We're now gonna begin with a few frequently asked questions that were submitted beforehand. And after that, we will go into live questions. If you pre-submitted your question and it was not answered during this FAQ portion, please feel free to ask it again using the chat feature below for, in order for it to be answered today. Just a reminder that if you would like to ask a live question, please type your name and what town you are from along with your question, and I will add you to a list of questioners. Now would be a great time to start submitting those questions as well. All right, Tom, for your first pre-submitted question, how realistic are the president's vaccination targets? Well, they better be realistic because there's nothing more urgent and important for this country right now than getting everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible. And um, for that to happen, we, we need a rational, efficient system and we need more supply. And both are a little bit lacking right now, as I'm sure a lot of folks uh, in this discussion have personally experienced. Um, the supply is not there yet. Um, as I mentioned, we're getting uh, in New Jersey enough roughly for about 25,000 uh, vaccinations per day. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean it's exactly 25,000 every day. It could be a little bit more, it could be a little bit less. And given the huge lack of organization and leadership at the federal level. Uh, New Jersey and all the other states, they're, they're not being told um, exactly you know, one week how much they're going to get uh, a week or two later. Um, and so not only don't, doesn't, doesn't the state have enough to, you know, to be able to vaccinate all of us as quickly as we might want, there's not enough certainty in the supply um, to be able to schedule out uh, appointments um, as far out ahead as we might want. And I'm sure a lot of people in this call have experienced the, the, the result of that. Um, the new administration has been in office for uh, less than a week, right? And so we now once again have an actual COVID task force, actual uh, leadership uh, at the federal level that is taking responsibility for this problem rather than saying, what the previous administration did, which is that it's just all up to the states. It's not our responsibility. Um, one of the first decisions that Biden has made uh, uh, is to set up um, uh, 
FEMA run, uh, Federal Emergency Management Administration run um, uh, testing, mega testing sites uh, in states all around the country. So we will get at least one of those sites in New Jersey. I don't think the location has been settled yet. Again, it's just been a few days. Um, but that will be a federally run and supported FEMA run um, testing site that will take some of the burden off of the state and help us accelerate this, uh, this process. Um, the 25,000 a day number should also increase as more vaccines are approved. We don't want to take any shortcuts. We want to make sure that uh, every vaccine that's approved is as safe as the ones that already uh, uh, are out there. Um, so full clinical trials uh, and all the rest. But I think we can safely assume that there will be more vaccines uh, approved and that therefore we will be able um, to ramp up well above 25,000 a day. Um, so, you know, I'm optimistic, but um, I would ask folks to be just a little bit patient over the, the, the coming week or two for the new team to get its act together. We will then, of course, be within our rights to hold them accountable, just as we held uh, the, the Trump administration accountable. But I think the plans they put into place are sensible and solid. Uh, and, and most of all, I have confidence that, uh, you know, that all of these folks are going to be working together to try to make this better rather than, um, rather than to absolve themselves of responsibility every day, which is what we were getting uh, from, from the, the last administration. Thank you, Tom. And just for everyone's awareness, a few weeks ago, our office held an event with uh, some of the health professionals in our district regarding vaccine uh, distribution in New Jersey. I'm going to drop the link to the video of that meeting that we had. Um, it, it's really informative. It might answer some of your frequently asked questions. And that's a good resource for any of you to use um, throughout this distribution process. All right, our next frequently asked question for Tom. Tom, what is the status of a COVID stimulus bill now that Joe Biden is in office? Yeah. So I, I spoke a little bit to this in my opening remarks, but basically President Biden has proposed uh, a COVID relief and stimulus. I still think it's more relief uh, bill uh, that would uh, cost another $1.9 trillion. Um, and cover a lot of the items that, that I mentioned. Um, there is a significant amount of money there for testing and vaccine distribution and development. Um, there is, I think, $130 billion uh, for schools uh, to accelerate the safe reopening of in-person instruction uh, in our country. There's money for childcare, uh, again, for the same reason we, we need families to have a place uh, to care for their kids while they're going back uh, to work. There's rental assistance um, um, uh, and mortgage relief, um, additional small business uh, assistance. There is the, uh, I think, very, very important child tax credit uh, that I mentioned. There are provisions to extend um, uh, uh, paid, uh, paid sick leave uh, for for folks, obviously, it, you know, we don't want a situation where people are testing positive for COVID and feeling that if they don't come to work, they're going to lose their jobs <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, we, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. We have to extend these programs and, and facilities until, uh, until we're out of it. Um, and it's got something that I've been fighting for forever, which is direct assistance to our state and local governments. Um, this was something that for whatever reason, Mitch McConnell uh, just put his foot down and refused to allow while he was majority leader in the United States Senate. It's super important for us in New Jersey because inevitably, right, state revenues, tax revenues declined this year, sales tax revenues, other things that are affected by this economic crisis. Some of our municipalities are doing fine, um, knock on wood, others, uh, have also uh, had to uh, cut back. And I don't want any of our municipalities to, um, to feel like they either have to cut the services we depend on or raise our property taxes. So, um, so that's a very important piece. 
what are the chances? I think the chances are extremely good that we will get a bill. Um, it probably won't be word for word what Joe Biden proposed because that's the give and take of the legislative process. Um, Democrats have 50 seats in the Senate. It's 50-50 with the vice president having a tiebreaker. Um, there are some Democrats who've expressed concern about some aspects of President Biden's plan. Um, there are some concerns about making sure that uh, that money, if we're going to be spending it, is really going to the people who need it um, and not to people making higher incomes. I'm kind of sympathetic to that. So we're going to look at the details. We're going to have some negotiation. The difference between now and last year, including last December, is that when we have a bill, we can not only get it passed in the House because we can schedule a vote there, we can get a vote in the United States Senate. And that was the problem for the last two years. On issue after issue after issue, we had legislation that could have passed the Senate because enough Democrats and Republicans supported that legislation, but McConnell would not allow a vote. Now we can negotiate something and make them vote, yes or no. So for that reason, I'm confident we're gonna get something and it's gonna be good. Probably won't be perfect, but that's, that's government. That's how it's supposed to work and we need to get back to work. Thank you, Tom. All right, we're going to start beginning live questioning. Again, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask a question live to Tom. All right, to start, we have Bob from Reddington. Bob, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, Tom, thank you very much for what you do for all of us. It is always greatly appreciated. Um, I am somewhat confused as to the names of the rallies or how many rallies were actually held in Washington on that infamous day. Um, I know that the um, rally that was hosted by or organized by Women for America first was to protest the election results. This was the executive director, um, Kylie Kramer. And they also hosted December, November marches, which both ended in violence. Now, this Stop the Steal, I'm not sure if this is the same as Trump's Save America rally, or if they were supposed to be two separate things. But Kramer stated that they want to keep Trump in the White House, okay? even though multiple judges ruled there are no evidence of election fraud. And when asked if her organization would accept the results, okay, if in fact um, the Congress certified the win, her quote was, we will cross that bridge when we come to it. Putting all of this together as to the purpose of these rallies, do you feel that it would be or would have been proper for any of our community leaders to have attended these rallies? Yeah. Um, I think I know what you're getting at there. Um, look, there were, there were a lot of different groups, as I understand it, as I have looked into what happened on that day. There were a lot of different groups and leaders from around the country that mobilized their followers to come to Washington that day. Um, some of these groups um, and leaders uh, 
are, can I think accurately be described as extremists, as violent extremists, even perhaps domestic terrorists. Um, many such as QAnon propagating um, dangerous conspiracy theories that have led to violence in our country, others racist, anti-Semitic, anti-government, anti-law enforcement. Um, and then there were other um, groupings and organizers and probably a larger share of the participants who weren't necessarily like, you know, members of the Proud Boys or the Three Percenters or the Oath Keepers um, or, you know, one of those radical organizations, but were there um, rallied by the president and his supporters to um, deny the legitimacy of the election and to put pressure, and this is the key, to put pressure on members of Congress, particularly Republican members of Congress, to not certify the election, to throw out the votes of Americans in states like Pennsylvania and Arizona and Georgia, uh, and to enable President Trump to stay in office despite the fact that he lost the election. Um, now, supporting that idea is something that is protected by the First Amendment in the sense that the First Amendment to the Constitution allows each of us to hold whatever opinions we may want to hold, um, no matter how crazy or bad or, um, uh, or dangerous one might think those ideas are. We all have the freedom of conscience and the freedom of speech and the freedom of peaceful assembly. So from a legal point of view, yes, anybody can believe what they want to believe, including that, you know, the election was stolen or whatever, and they can go to a peaceful demonstration. Um, but I still think that is not the right thing to do for anybody who is in a position of responsibility or leadership in this country. And we can deal with that, of course, through all the democratic means we have. If one of our leaders has participated in an effort to overturn the democratic election, even if they did it peacefully and legally, we can express our views at the ballot box the next time that person is up for, for re-election. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think that's what you're getting. At. Now, there are people who committed acts of violence. There are people who trespassed on federal property. There are people who committed other crimes. And those which is, which I'm sorry, which is not what I was addressing. You, yeah, I, you I, address my point of whether or not, for example, a mayor of one of our towns mm -hmm. should have even been there in the first place. There are those people that went with intent, and that's a different situation. Okay. There's a very powerful video, which I cannot literally quote because this is a family Zoom. Um, it was an interview with a police officer who was almost killed that day, a Capitol Police officer. And he described being in this massive crowd, this mob of people who were attacking him, screaming at him, massing on him, threatening him with violence, pushing him, tearing at him, punching him. And you know what happened to the officer who was beaten to death that day and others who were almost beaten to death. And this officer described the scene and he said, you know, at first I thought of taking out my gun and using deadly force, but then I thought, you know what, there's so many of them, they would take the gun and that would be their excuse to kill me. So then I decided to appeal to their conscience. And I said, I'm a family man. I have a wife. I have three children. And at that point, two or three members of the mob started to protect me. They made a little circle around me. And that, got, that bought me the time to get out of there. And then the officer said, I've been thinking about what I think about those people who helped me. And it comes down to this. I wanna to say to them, thank you for helping me, 
and F you for being there. And I'm sorry if even that those initials offend anybody, but like, I think that captures how I feel, even about people who were there and who didn't break a particular law, even those who were there who may have at that moment tried to help somebody. No, I don't think anybody should have been there because the purpose of that march, that rally, if you can call it that, was even if you weren't there to use violence, it was to stop the United States Congress from doing its constitutional duty. It was to overturn an election, which would have meant if they had succeeded overturning our democratic system of government. Thank you both for that question. All right, next up, we have Julie from Alexandria Township. Julie, can you hear us? Yes, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, great. Um, how important is universal health care to you? Um, how do we prioritize working class people? And my third question, you take these in any order, um, is what plans do the Democratic Party leaders have for the future for preventing another Trump-like dictator from taking power? Um, okay. and, and I have, let me, go ahead. Let me take those two, because those are both big questions. Um, yeah. I mean, the first one, I mean, I'll start with the easy answer. I believe healthcare is a human right. I, I think it's a disgrace that there are still folks in America who do not have access to affordable good health insurance. Um, I think it's a disgrace that we provide this human right in America by, in the, in the least efficient, most expensive way possible, which is you get sick, you go to an emergency room, you don't have insurance, well, give you basic treatment, everybody pays, right? But it's the worst way of providing it. Um, we have been promising to fix that problem in America for well over a generation. We took a step forward with the Affordable Care Act. It was not good enough um, because we still have people who don't have access to good affordable health insurance in America. Um, the next step, I believe, um, that is achievable given where we are in the House, Senate, the White House right now, in my opinion, is to um, shore up the Affordable Care Act and add a public option. Um, give every American the freedom to choose a public plan like Medicare um, on top of what we can already get on the, uh, on the exchanges. I think that's something that can be done. It would be a huge improvement it might not be the final step, but it would be a huge improvement over the status quo. And I think it's achievable, though difficult, in the current Congress. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about the mechanics of how you do difficult things in the current Congress, but that's something that I hope we go for this year. Um, do you support, then, uh, I, sure, this is a um, do you support putting Medicare for all to a floor vote in the house, even knowing it probably won't get through just so that constituents can see where the representatives are at. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fine with anything getting a vote and I'm also fine with telling people where I'm at, um, whether there's a vote or not, I'll always answer your question, right? So you can, you can uh, decide accordingly, right? Uh, what you think of me and, um, and I have, I have not been in favor of Medicare for all. I've been, you know, very uh, clear about that. Some people want me to, some people definitely don't want me to, but that's, that's been my position. I don't think, I don't think that we can leap in a single bound from the system of private health insurance that we've set up over decades in this country to a single payer system. Very few countries around the world, including many that are cited as examples of single payer actually have single payer. Most, most countries have some mix of private insurance and a, and a government run or public option. Um, so I think the achievable goal, um, and I want it to be real, I don't wanna just have symbolic votes. I wanna help people this year. I wanna help people next year. The achievable thing, the step that we can take, I believe is the one that we just, that, that I just mentioned. Um, and remember in, in when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, 
we had Democrats at 60 votes, 60 in the, in the Senate, and even then could not get the public option through. We were one vote away from getting a public option. So this stuff is not easy. Uh, I think we're further, uh, we've, the country has moved further along um, on healthcare since 2010, where we can achieve more today than we could then. But my, my preoccupation for the next two years is delivering. It's not messaging, it's governing and delivering. And that's what we can deliver. On preventing future Trump-like abuses, we have got a great bill that we introduced uh, in the House last year called the Protecting Our Democracy Act. Take a look at that. Um, it basically covers most of the things that this the previous president did that, 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 that many of us felt were contrary to um, the rule of law and uh, our constitutional system of checks and balances, like um, spending money that Congress uh, appropriated for one thing on something else by using emergency powers, uh, firing inspectors general that are supposed to root out corruption in government departments, firing them for political reasons, refusing to respect congressional subpoenas when we're investigating wrongdoing, uh, taking payments from foreign governments uh, in violation, we think of the emoluments clause, all of those things. And we try to basically, in that bill, legislate protections against any future president doing those things. When we introduced it, it didn't have much of a chance because it was seen as an anti-Trump bill. Trump was in the White House. I, I think the dynamic is going to be different now that Biden is in the White House. And um, you know, I think in addition to our 50 Democrats in the Senate and our small majority in the House, I'd like to go to some of the Republicans and say, hey, guys, uh, we got this bill here that says Joe Biden has to respect your subpoenas. What do you say? You against that? And Biden will be fine with it, right? He's not going to abuse these, these privileges. So I think actually having, you know, ironically, this is a little cynical, but right, having a Democratic president makes it easier to pass legislation that restricts all future presidents from doing some of those things. So I'm hopeful um, that we can do it. We'll certainly test it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Tom. All right, we're going to take a question from Facebook Live. This question comes from Lisa from Hunterdon County. She says, we still struggle with unreliable internet and week long power outages during pretty, uh, pretty large weather events, inconsequential weather events. This is a challenge, especially this year when more folks are telecommuting and attending school from their homes and need internet and power to work and learn. Is there anything happening at the federal level to improve these services in rural areas? Uh, yes. So. Uh, I mentioned my great hope that we can do a big infrastructure bill or bills this year as part of the COVID recovery. Um, and I also mentioned that there are a lot of other good things we can achieve as we invest that money. Even if our motivation is just economic stimulus, putting people to work, we can invest it to solve long festering problems in our country. And one of those uh, is rural broadband. Uh, being uh, not what it needs to be. So we actually did in the House of Representatives last year pass uh, a rural broadband infrastructure bill. And that will absolutely be part of what we put forward this year now that we have the Senate and the president willing to uh, go along uh, with, uh, with these things. Um, and I also did mention, I think, the, the need for investment in our electric grid as part of uh, an infrastructure package. That's super important for uh, rural areas like Hunterdon County, where we all live with uh, the power outages and, um, you know, uh, I got a generator, but I, I shouldn't have to, right? We shouldn't have to be investing in, uh, in, in home power generation in 21st century America. Um, so, uh, so that will definitely be, be, uh, be part of it, uh, be helpful to us. And then it'll help our larger national goal of electrifying our economy because you know we want to we want to generate more electricity through uh, wind and solar, um, but then we're going to need to upgrade the grid to get that electricity to people's homes and to car charging stations and factories and everything else. So 
that would be part of the deal if uh, if things go the way I hope they do. And that's what I'll be working hard for as a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee this year. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Our next question comes from Frank from Raritan. Frank, can you hear us? Yes. We can hear you. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you, Congressman. Hey, uh, my question is, um, how likely is it now that the Democrats are back in the Senate that we might see some re relief on the uh, salt tax limit for the uh, for um, income tax deduction? Yeah, here, here, here. Um, so this was uh, it, it's a huge priority for all of us and for me. Um, in my first term, I didn't have a lot of hope that this could get through the Senate, but I wanted to make a point of showing that the House agrees with us that the SALT deduction, which has been in the tax code since we had an income tax in the 19th century, that it needed to remain part of the, the tax code. So uh, I got Pelosi to put a bill on the floor um, in the House to fully restore the SALT deduction. And she did that and we passed it um, with all the Democrats and a few Republicans voting with us as well. There was no way that McConnell was going to let that see the light of day in, in the Senate. Um, he, he was not just slightly against it, but like passionately uh, so. And, and this became for for some Republicans, for some states, again, some are with us, but, but for some of them, it became like a big messaging point actually in this last election that the SALT deduction was some huge giveaway to blue states, to Democrat states. And we can't allow that. I mean, that was a big part of their message in states in the South and uh, uh, in the West. So that's still something that, that we have to overcome. Now, how likely is it? We got 50 votes plus one. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to the filibuster. And that's, you know, for better or worse, a critical part of knowing what the right answer to your question is. Um, if we just have 50 votes plus one, I don't think we will be able to pass certainly a standalone bill that would restore the SALT deduction in whole or in part. Um, with the filibuster gone, that changes the equation a little bit. So we'll have to see what happens there. Um, there will be some forcing events. Um, we, we definitely need to get back to tax reform in some way, because in that horrible 2017 tax reform bill that took away our SALT deductions, uh, a lot of the middle class tax cuts start expiring in 2021. Guess what? Um, the, the, the corporate tax cuts don't expire, but the, the ones for regular folks start expiring, right? So there's going to be a huge incentive to get back into tax reform. Um, a lot of us think that the corporate tax cut was too generous as well, that we need to do a lot more about repatriating corporate profits that are stashed overseas, a lot of other things. So if I'm right, that means there will be a push in the next two years to do a big tax bill. And that's the opportunity for us to insist that part of it needs to address SALT in uh, in some way. And whether we can do it or not is a political question. It'll depend, as I mentioned, I think in part on uh, the Senate rules and the filibuster. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Next up, we have Mike from Hillsboro. Mike, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you for taking my question. Um, it's a what do you view as the top federal government priorities for addressing climate change and what sort of near-term actions do you plan on taking? Uh, thank you so much. So I've, I've mentioned one near-term action because uh, I think it's our first and best opportunity and that's through the infrastructure legislation that we hope to pass this year, right? Because, you know, imagine we're spending, uh, investing, I think is a better word here, uh, a very large amount of money in our nation's infrastructure. We have all kinds of choices to make in how we invest it. And if we're smart, 
we will make those choices in a way that speeds our nation's transition to clean power. Uh, we can invest more in mass transit. We can invest in smart highways. Uh, we can invest in electric charging stations. And as I mentioned, strengthening and upgrading our national electric grid to deliver that electricity. We can uh, invest in green infrastructure, um, all kinds of things. And that's what Biden has proposed doing. It's what I support doing and um, what we will fight for in, in the coming uh, few months. Um, then the question is, can we pass actually a climate bill uh, in, in this Congress? And, you know, I'm, I'm a very strong supporter, for example, of the carbon fee and dividend proposal to put a market price on um, uh, the use of uh, uh, carbon-based energy that takes into account the real costs of pumping all that carbon into the atmosphere and to give both consumers and the private sector the incentives needed to speed the transition to using more clean energy. Here's the really interesting thing. Um, most of corporate America that I talk to now supports this because look, they get it. They know the world is moving to clean energy. They want to lead that transition. They want our country to lead the transition, but they want the certainty that comes with government saying, yeah, we're definitely going there. And the companies that lead the way will be rewarded. And and won't be undercut by cheap competitors. And so what I'm hopeful of and what I will be encouraging is to, to for, for those mainstream chamber of commerce voices, which are very powerful uh, in the Congress, realistically, um, to be heard more strongly over the coming year, because um, you know, unfortunately, most members of the Republican Party who are elected in the House and Senate are still reluctant to touch this because activists in their party have railed against it for the last 10 years. Um, but I think they're increasingly going to be hearing from the insurance industry, from the financial industry, which is worried about the massive costs of climate change, even from some of the larger fossil fuel companies like ExxonMobil that have now come out for a carbon tax basically, um, th that, could be, that could be transformational. So start with infrastructure, doing it in, um, uh, in a way that promotes uh, green energy. Um, and then let's see if we can actually pass a climate bill. And then meanwhile, Biden's rejoined the Paris Accords. There's a lot that he can do just through his own authority to uh, promote clean energy and cutting emissions. Thanks, Mike. Great, thank you. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Tom. Next up, we have Martha from North Plainfield. Martha, can you hear us? Martha R. from North Plainfield. Hi, hi, Tom. I'm so hey, relieved that you were reelected. Thank you. And I thank you very much for all that you do for us. Now, my question is, Oh, actually, I have a lot, but <laughs> the one is, um, what's the scuttlebutt that you're hearing in Congress about um, Trump being impeached, enough Republicans voting to impeach, not to impeach, to indict him? Mm -hmm. What are you hearing? Uh, well, you know, that's the Senate. I know, and, um, I know. You don't, so, you guys don't. <laughs> uh, I don't have any inside baseball that you don't that you can't get from reading all the stuff that's out there. Uh, I think I'll tell you this: if if everybody in the Senate just voted their conscience, my prediction would be that he'd be convicted quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. um, the Democrats, of course, will all vote to convict. There are several Republicans who I think are pretty open in saying that they would now. And I think a lot of others who are just so sick of him, so fed up with what they had to endure the last few years, not just the country. Um, and so 
disgusted by what happened on January 6th, which they, including majority leader or minority leader, sorry, Mitch McConnell, um, have clearly said, clearly laid at, at former President Trump's feet that if it were a free vote of conscience for them, absolutely they would do it. By the way, they also feel politically that um, uh, you know that the former President Trump is responsible for them losing the Senate and uh, and and is making their party less and less attractive to young people mm -hmm. and color and you know it, it's weighing them all down. Um, that said, I think a lot of them are afraid. Yeah, that's um, the impression I've gotten. They're afraid of political death because anybody who votes for impeachment will, in the Republican Party, will be primaried. Um, and so they're, you know, they're afraid that they could be defeated in a Republican primary. And I'm very sad to say some of them are afraid of physical violence. Mm. Because it's real. It's a, you know, mm -hmm. they're understandably afraid of physical violence. Um, and, you know, to me, that is, that argument is the clincher, you know, if, if a president of the United States creates a political movement that will threaten to kill you, if you vote to hold that president accountable, then that in and of itself, in my view, is a pretty strong argument for impeachment and conviction, even mm -hmm. after the president has left office. But it's not easy to face death threats. I face death threats. Mm. You have a family, you know. So I don't know what's going to happen, but those are the factors at play. And you know, and to be fair, there are also Republicans who honestly, sincerely are against it too, for their own reasons. Right? But the, what, what makes me sad are the ones who I think would vote yes, if not for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank there's you. there's one, um, something that bugs me. And when people bring up universal health care and Medicare for all, mm -hmm. I don't think the younger people understand that we who receive Medicare actually pay, that it costs us money, it's not free. So when the issue comes up, would you mention that? <laughs> because yeah, really, because I think people think it's free, and it's not. Of course, nothing, nothing is free. Right. Uh, it is. You know, I do feel strongly. I agree with them when they say it's a right. You know. Oh, I everything. agree. I agree with that. And it's it's in my interest for you to have health care, and it's in your interest for me to have health care, right? Mm -hmm. But um, one way or another, whatever system we have, we're paying either through premiums or through taxes. We'll be paying. And um, so, yes, that, that has to be accepted. Well, Thank it's you. a deduction. It's a deduction from my social security. Yeah. And um, it's not a small amount. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. All right, just to let everyone on this call know, we are gonna go a little past uh, three o'clock just to make sure we answer as many questions as we can. Next up, we have John from Bridgewater. John, can you hear us? Yes, hi, thank you. Hi, John. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom, I read uh, this past week you that you joined the um, uh, Problem Solvers uh, Caucus. Mm -hmm. and I was just wondering what the impetus was for uh, joining and uh, what you hope to get out of it. Uh, sure. So. Problem Solvers Caucus is, it's really the only effective um, group or body in the Congress that brings Republicans and Democrats together. Um, and it's not, it's sort of got a reputation for being kind of moderate or middle of the road. It's not really what it is. It, it's, it, it's a bunch of people, 28 Republicans, 28 Democrats, who are at least trying to figure out what they can agree on even as we disagree on a lot of other things, which I feel, you know, I probably one, one of the most common questions I've gotten in these 
town halls over the last two or three years is what can be done to find those areas of common agreement and common interest, even as we fight each other over the things that we disagree on. And so the purpose of the group is, is to do that. Um, I was actually very critical of it um, and, and want to be very candid about this when I was running against my predecessor, Congressman Lance, who was also a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus and would, would sort of, you know, his answer, I felt fairly or not, his answer to too many questions was, well, I'm a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus and that, that should be enough for you. Um, and I didn't think that, uh, that this caucus, when the Republicans were in control, was doing enough to, um, to, to force moderate, um, responsible, non-radical legislation to a vote that most Democrats and Republicans would have uh, agreed to. But in my first term, particularly at the very end, uh, I saw them actually come together to do some things that were very useful. Um, the last uh, COVID relief bill, the one that we passed in December, that was the Problem Solvers Caucus. The leadership was failing. Um, Democratic leadership, Republican leadership, Trump leadership, like there was nothing. And the action basically um, was all in this group um, where a bunch of Republicans and Democrats got together and negotiated something that wasn't perfect, but that was going to help a lot of people. And then they got a similar group going in the Senate and that jump started the process. And in the end, the bill that passed was basically very similar to what they negotiated. Um, that was the room where it happened. And so I, I joined this because I want to be in the place where bipartisan compromises are struck. I think there are going to be more uh, in the next two years. If the filibuster is removed in the Senate, then of course, yes, Democrats will be able, if, if all 50 hold together, to pass things without Republicans. But I'm not counting on that, uh, which means that on all the issues I care about, there's still going to need to be some effort to get more reasonable, uh, pragmatic Republicans on board. And if that happens, it'll be done in this group. I want to be there to influence that process and to fight for the stuff that I care about. Um, and when I have a bill that I introduce, you know, I, I want to get as much support as I possibly can. And this is the best vehicle for getting those Republicans to uh, to join me. Because I got to tell you, there are just very few other venues where, where those conversations happen. Um, so that's why I did it. There's no obligation on me. I don't have to support anything I don't already support. Um, my voting record will be exactly the same as it was in the last Congress. Um, it's just a, another uh, tool that I can use to exert influence on the decisions that are being made on Capitol Hill uh, and a way of generating cross-party support for the things that I care about. Thanks, John. Glad you're a part of it, Tom. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, John. Just a reminder, if everyone could keep their mics muted at all times, um, this will help us all reduce background noise and hear everyone speaking a little clearer. Um, that also being said, I see a few people having their hands raised. If you would like to ask a question, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to first ask your question. If you have your hands raised, you still need to use the chat feature. All right, up next, we have Nancy from Basking Ridge. Nancy, can you hear us? Yes, hello. Hi, Nancy. Hi, how are you, Tom? I'm good. I'm just wondering, I know white, white supremacy is such a huge problem, both locally and nationally, but I'm just wondering, just in terms of us as citizens, you know, beyond just, you know, awareness and, you know, aligning with people to help fight racism, like, is there anything else we can do in terms of, you know, just fighting for human rights? I know, you know, ideologically it's, you know, not like it's not easy practically, but I just wondered if you would have any advice in terms of, you know, what yeah. more we can do. Uh, you know, there are great organizations that, you know, in addition to what government should do, which is what I'm focused on, 
and, and I can assure you, huge change in the last two or three weeks, right? We, we will have a unified government effort with law enforcement, the FBI, the Justice Department, Department of Homeland Security, all in, in fighting this violence and this extremism, um, which should not be a partisan thing. We just should be against violence and, and hatred wherever it's coming from. And um, you saw the difference in the United States Capitol in Washington between January 6th and January 20th, the inauguration day, because these these guys were coming back on January 20th, but they didn't because in just 14 days, the federal government mustered an offensive effort. We were playing offense, not just defense, um, beginning to arrest people who took part in that rally and the organizers and the social media companies, in my view, did the right thing, starting to shut down uh, more of their communications. Parlor went down, all of that stuff in just 14 days. Massive, massive difference. Um, and so I think you will see that over the next coming years, uh, certainly the next year or two, we're, we're, we're really going to have a unified, serious national effort. Um, and I'll take part in it in the ways that, that I've described uh, to you. But there are a lot of um, uh, private organizations, national and local, that are working on this in our um, in our part of New Jersey, a lot of our faith institutions, our churches, our synagogues and mosques have come together um, to promote uh, um, uh, interfaith understanding and tolerance, um, to promote education uh, of their congregations and in our schools. Um, so if you're a member of, the, of a faith community, uh, I would um, see if uh, if, if you are um, church, synagogue, or mosque, or, or, or temple, or what have you, is, is uh, engaged in those efforts, and, and if so, join. If not, encourage them to do that. And our office can connect you to some who are leaders in our community who, who are uh, engaged. Um, and, um, you know, we need to encourage our schools to uh, teach the history of, of America in a way that uh, that prepares our kids for, for these kinds of debates. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a deeply proud American patriot. I love this country. Uh, but what I love about it is that it's, it's this long history of correcting imperfections. And you have to understand the imperfections in our history to, to understand what's happening today and to have hope for the future. Um, so, you know, encouraging our local educators to talk about uh, this stuff. Um, and then supporting organizations like the Anti-Defamation League uh, nationally that are at the forefront of identifying the threat from um, white supremacy and other forms of violent extremism um, and, uh, and who pressure then people like me and the government to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for that question, Nancy. Next up, we have Elizabeth from North Plainfield. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. First, we have uh, Peter from Basking Ridge. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, yes, I uh, just wanted to say thank you for your service. I really appreciate it. Um, my question is really two parts. The first is uh, around large, big money contributions uh, to our political uh, you know, discourse in this country. And what are your views on how we could try to minimize that uh, without necessarily limiting uh, First Amendment rights? Um, right. I do question the need for that with uh, corporations, of course. But, uh, you know, how do we do that in a way that everybody can have their say, but at the same time, large amounts of money are not driving uh, the direction the uh, discourse is going in this country? Yeah, it's thank you for the, the question. That's a it's a hugely important point because um, one of the frustrations so many Americans have is that there seems to be too little connection between what we vote for and who we vote for and then what happens. <laughs> and, and, and this is one reason that, 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 that money, big money, corporate money uh, in politics uh, also too often determines what happens. Uh, so I've, you may know, I, don't take any corporate contributions. That's my personal policy. And I've encouraged other 
members of Congress to uh, take the same pledge and, and many more have in the last couple of years. Um, so that's number one. Number two, uh, we have a bill, many of you know about this, uh, called HR1 because it was the first bill that we introduced in the last Congress um, that we are going to reintroduce and pass in this Congress that um, makes uh, all political contributions more transparent. Uh, it, it tries to ban dark money in the sense that uh, it, it, it requires all uh, contributions to um, PACs and other organizations, nonprofits that try to influence our election outcomes. It requires those contributions to be public and transparent so that at least we know who's trying to influence whom and with how much money. We can't actually limit the amount of money or prevent, say, corporations from contributing unlimited amounts of money to politicians or to PACs that influence uh, campaigns uh, because of the Citizens United decision that the Supreme Court issued a few years ago, which basically said that corporations are people and money is speech and you can't stop people from speaking. And so that allowed unlimited corporate contributions. The only way we can change that is by passing a constitutional amendment to repeal the Citizens United decision, which I'm very, very much for, and I think would be very popular uh, in America among people of all political persuasions. Thank you. Thank you both. Now we have Elizabeth from North Plainfield. Elizabeth, can you hear us? Elizabeth. Oops. That's all right. I thought I heard something, but we can move on. All right, let's go to Joanne T. Joanne, can you hear us? Joanne? Okay, no worries. Let's go next up. We have Ariel from Hillsboro. Ariel, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Um, I just wanted to ask, what support is there available for the arts in New Jersey? At the moment, New York City is somewhat decentered as the center of the art world, and there's an outflow of many creatives from the city. How can New Jersey sort of stimulate the economy using this outflow of creatives, but also use it to build community ties? I know like arts probably isn't the most popular conversation with this group, but it's something that's deeply important to me. Um, and I also feel that it's really not possible to have a creative studio practice and rely on that as a sole generator of income. Like that's no longer reality. And I could see, I can understand this question might not be popular, but I'm just curious. Oh, well don't first, no, no one should worry <laughs> whether a question is popular or not. If it's important to you, we wanna, I wanna hear about it. Um, and the arts are very important to me. I have to admit it, you know, we've, we've had a year of existential crisis right for the country and the economy so the urgent sometimes crowds out the the important um but this is important uh one of the things actually speaking of urgent that we did in the coronavirus relief bill that we passed in december uh was to uh provide some dedicated support to performing arts venues because obviously like they're incredibly hard hit right now. You can't have a live performing arts venue in the middle of COVID. So um, we created a grant program in that bill to, um, the phrase was save our stages. Because, you know, it, A, it's a part of the economy that we want to save, and B, it's it, it's part of the fabric of our communities. And, um, and we don't want to lose that because of the, the pandemic. Um, as far as, um, uh, arts, uh, support for the arts in general. I'm a strong supporter of uh, a federal support to the arts through the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. Um, that's something the previous administration tried to cut, uh, virtually eliminate, and we prevented that, at least in the Congress. I would love to see much more federal support for, uh, for the arts. And then your specific question about New Jersey, let, let, let us let us think about that because you make a very good point that um, this could be an opportunity for us actually to attract more um, uh, uh, 
to attract folks who, who may be looking for an alternative to living uh, uh, and performing and, and, um, and doing their, their creative work in New York City. And um, that would be great for the, the, the quality and uh, of our lives and, and, and our ability to pursue happiness in small towns in New Jersey. So would love to explore with you ways we can encourage that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ariel. All right, uh, now we will go again to Elizabeth from North Plainfield. Seems like she forgot to unmute. So Elizabeth, do we have you here? Elizabeth? Oh, I'm here, thank you. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, okay. I, it's a more local question, but it, and it brings us back to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, wondering how we're going to reach out to people who don't really have access to healthcare on a regular basis, or they may be fearful of accessing healthcare, even in their neighborhoods. Um, we have some communities that are pretty diverse in Somerset County. Yeah. And uh, English is not necessarily their first language. How do we reach them, communicate to them the importance yeah. of testing and vaccines? Yeah, so look, it's a great question because reaching everybody is the right thing to do. It's also uh, in all of our selfish interest, right? I mean, you can't, you can't beat an infectious disease unless everybody is protected. Um, uh, and so this has to, this has to cut across every line. Uh, what language you speak, your income, uh, ethnicity, religion, whether you're uh, including whether you're uh, a, a, a lawful or undocumented immigrant in this country, whatever you may think about that, like everyone needs to be tested and vaccinated to protect everybody else. Um, so this has been a big emphasis in the programs that we've passed in Congress. Um, we've set aside funding within, within the testing and now immunization programs that we've created. We've set aside dedicated funding for community outreach to underserved communities, communities of color to folks who may not have good online access, obviously folks who don't speak English as their first language. Um, so it, this is now implemented by states and by counties and local, local governments. Um, but the funding we have provided and the programs we've created at the federal level explicitly say that there has to be a dedicated effort to reach out to uh, these underserved communities. For testing, for example, you know, we've set up in New Jersey uh, mobile, uh, mobile testing um, that, that goes right into uh, underserved communities. Um, obviously, there's a lot of coordination between our state and local government agencies and local community-based organizations that are trusted by uh, communities that may not trust the government um, all that much. Uh, are we doing everything that we should be or can be? Probably not, but, um, but that's absolutely uh, the, the intention. Um, by the way, Nareet, one thing we haven't, uh, we were gonna announce the hotline. Yes, we were. I will um, go ahead, if Tom, you wanna speak about it and I can put the hotline number into the chat. Yeah, so this is up today. Uh, this is live today. The state has established, a, it's a 1-800 number, a hotline for the COVID vaccine. Uh, and no, I don't think you can call the hotline and get an appointment, <laughs> but uh, I wish. But uh, it, it's, it's a place to go if you have any questions about the process, what's likely to happen, uh, the resources that may exist in your community. Um, and that, you know, to, to, to the previous question, um, that is uh, at least in Spanish. And I don't know, are there other languages as well, Nareet? Do you know? That I do not know of, but I will go ahead and look that up and hopefully make an announcement for the end of the call. Certainly there's, there, there, there is a Spanish language hotline. Um, so if you put up the 800 number so that folks will have it, that would be great. I just dropped that number into the chat. Um, you know, if people don't see it, I will just read it off right now. It is 855-568-0545. I'll read that one more time. 855-568-0545. Five, 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 
0545. This is the New Jersey vaccination hotline. They have representatives available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to answer your questions about the vaccine and point you to the nearest vaccination location as well. We have one final questioner ready to go, and that is Dan from Clinton. Dan, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Dan. Great. Hi, Tom. Tom, uh, the question that I had was really two of them I posed, which is, is there a plan to censure uh, House members who participated in the insurrection, namely Mo Brooks, uh, a few of the representatives from Arizona, and then possibly even Matt Gates? And then second of that is, can the FCC put more strident communication rules in place that limit the proliferation of false reports, lies, and that circulation that happens all over uh, some of those particular TV uh, news shows and things like that? Yeah. So your second question is the more complicated one, obviously. You know, be, before I got into the business of trying to fight this scourge of violent extremism in, in our country. I, I, I spent my life as a human rights advocate and a very, very strong believer in the First Amendment and freedom of speech. And I always remind myself that we need to be careful, right? After 9-11, we, you know, we had a horrible terrorist attack and everybody was afraid and we had to protect our country. We had to do some things to protect our country but we also went too far in some respects, right? In, in, in undermining civil liberties and allowing things like torture that were wrong. And then we have to write the balance. Um, I want us to be incredibly vigilant and determined in fighting this threat, but I also want us to be, you know, always think about the precedent that we're setting for future generations. Um, so, um, can the FCC do something? I'm sure that the new FCC under President Biden is going to look very hard at this question. Um, you know, we used to have a fairness doctrine for broadcast media, which uh, made sense because the, the broadcast channels broadcast over public airwaves, right? And so there was, the government had um, standing legally to say, if you're gonna broadcast on public airwaves, we can set some rules, equal time, uh, rules and, and other things. Um, that would be harder for cable, but I'm sure that there will be a lot of thought given to that question. On social media, I mentioned my, uh, the legislation that I'm introducing, um, which it doesn't force the companies to censor or do anything else. It just says that they would be subject to the same liability as anybody else in our society. Um, if um, content that they promote on their social networks through the algorithms, the software that they write, which makes content appear in our news feeds, if that content can be shown to have led to real offline violence, real world violence, like an act of terrorism. Um, and that would just mean that like a newspaper or publisher, regular publisher, they, they would that they would be vulnerable at least to a lawsuit, which they would have to defend themselves again. Doesn't mean that they would lose the lawsuit, just that they would have to take that into account. Um, so look, watch that space. That's that's where I think we are we are heading. On censuring members of Congress, uh, and you mentioned Mo Brooks. Uh, uh, that's Mo Brooks of Alabama, not Mel Brooks. Uh, uh, so Mo Brooks is. Um, you know, I sometimes refer to this as the QAnon caucus or the Cuckoo caucus. It, it's a small group of them who are really, really out there. And um, Representative Brooks on the morning of January 6th uh, addressed the mob that was gathering at the White House to march on the Capitol. And after denouncing his fellow Republican members of Congress as traitors and weaklings, he said to the mob, today is the day when American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. Mm -hmm. And we can do that on our way to Capitol Hill. That is clear a case of incitement as we saw by a politician around the attack on the Capitol on January 
six because members of that audience that he was speaking to who he told to start taking down names and kicking ass then marched to capitol hill and beat the life out of a police officer and tried to kill members of congress um, and so there will be a censure resolution brought against mo brooks and it will be brought by your congressman because i'm you. moving out um there will be another one brought against Louis Gomer of Texas, who um, also basically, well, explicitly said we need to be violent. Um, as for the others, again, I want to be careful, right? I, 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 I don't want to be driven solely by anger, even though I'm angry. Um, there will be referrals to the Ethics Committee in cases that are maybe a bit more complicated or ambiguous and um, and a chance to investigate and for those members to answer for what they did and defend themselves. Um, in some cases, you know, theoretically, we could find more than just verbal incitement. There are allegations. I don't know if they're true, but there are allegations that some members may have colluded more directly with uh, the rioters. Um, if that were true, then uh, I, I would hope that the House would, would take action. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna do it carefully uh, with with due process for allegations that are as serious as that. Um, Mo Brooks, it's like he, he said what he said um, publicly. The video is there. He continues to say that he's proud of it. He's shown no remorse. So that's a simple question for the House: Do we stand for that or not? And and I think. A pretty big majority of us will say, no, we don't stand for that, including a lot of Republicans who are as fed up and angry as I am. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And thanks, Tom. All right, we are nearing the end of this call. I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated during this call. We had some really great questions throughout. I want to remind everyone that our office does provide updates on the latest in Congress and uh, announcements for our latest events through our e-newsletter. Um, I encourage you all to subscribe to our newsletter. I will put the link in the chat. And just a reminder that that link is malinowski.house.gov slash contact slash newsletter dash subscribe. Again, I'm putting that in the chat feature right now for the latest updates from our office and event announcements, please subscribe to our email list and look out for us on social media because we make all of our announcements there as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom for some closing remarks. Thank you, Nareed. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this was great. Uh, I love doing these and the conversations that we have and all the different directions that you take me in. Um, I get a pretty consistent message, I think, from, from these that, that, you know, this is, this is a moment when we really have to be focused on, on solving the country's problems um, and delivering on COVID, on healthcare, on infrastructure, on issues that affect our lives in New Jersey. And at the same time, we got to stand up for American principles because if we don't, um, we lose this country and we can't afford to do that. And so that's what I'm gonna to try to do with your help and your guidance. And these conversations really help me focus my, myself on, on what's important to you. So thank you so much again. Uh, please stay in touch with us. Lots and lots of uh, important federal programs that have been put into place uh, uh, for, for COVID and economic relief and hopefully more to come. Um, and I know that creates a demand and sometimes bureaucratic obstacles to people who are looking for help. Please know that you can always reach out to my team and we'll do our best, uh, our very best uh, uh, to help. So, uh, and you know how to do that. Um, with that, thank you again and look forward to uh, our next opportunity to get together. Bye-bye. <laughs>